Well, good morning. Thank you for showing up. We're uh, going to spend the next four weeks. We may actually truncate it down to three weeks, depending on, on how the timing goes. But uh, the topic, obviously, is that of spiritual gifts. And what we want to do is explore why knowing what our spiritual gifts are is so important to our own relationship with God, as well as to the health of his body, the church. So before we get started, let me quick pray for us. Father, we are so grateful that you have left us your word. We know that you live within us. We've been given that promise. But you don't just leave us alone to try to find out who you are and how you want us to live. So thank you for your word. And we pray that you would help us to understand some of the things that you've told us in your word about how we should relate to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you folk were uh, in the series last spring, last February, actually, on the Holy Spirit? So a few of you. There's going to be some review of that. I'm going to try to compress that entire four weeks into about 20 minutes. Uh, but I think that that's a good foundation for us since the Holy Spirit is one of the givers of the gifts. As a matter of fact, of the four major passages where spiritual gifts are outlined and enumerated, two of them specifically say that uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us these gifts. And so this class, this series, is really kind of a follow-on to last year's series on the Holy Spirit. But why would we even go over this series? These gifts are given by God to be used for very specific purposes and to make his church function in such a way that he will be glorified, that it will be the best functioning church to bring him glory. So over the next weeks, what we're going to look at is, as I just mentioned, a summary of the previous series on who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. What are spiritual gifts in general? Why were these gifts given? What are the specific spiritual gifts? And as I said, there are listings in the Bible, but there are, if you ask an author, what are the spiritual gifts? You could ask five authors and probably get five different lists. There'd be a lot of crosstalk and overlap because of the scriptural listings of the gifts. And then there will be some others that they will pick uh, as, uh, as additional gifts that are not specifically enumerated, but that you can easily extract from a text. We're going to focus primarily on those which are enumerated in those four passages that I alluded to. How do we discover our spiritual gift or gifts? And that's one of the things which I think it would be really nice to have as a strong outcome of this series, is what gifts have I been given? And then how do I use those gifts? So the Just Yes. Are we talking about the gifts of the spirit or spiritual gifts? Spir the uh, they will will explore that. Okay. They are the same. The only reason I, as a matter of fact, this class was originally titled "Gifts of the Spirit" as a follow-on to who the Holy Spirit is. But I, as I read more. I saw that uh, Jesus gives gifts. The Father gives gifts. So I put it all under the one umbrella, spiritual gifts. And so we'll, we'll uh, enumerate those as we go through those various listings. So as with past series, 
that I've had the privilege to lead were going to consist of both lecture and discussion. We really would like this to be a time where we can interface with each other at the end and know that I am not the fount of all knowledge, that you all have a lot of knowledge and uh, we can all learn from each other. Sometimes I uh, get too involved and the discussion time decreases at the end and so uh, uh, that's why I don't want to say that we will de definitely collapse this series into three weeks. We will probably go the full four weeks. Just mentioned about the session uh, for questions, discussion at the end after the lecture portion. Uh, we may spill over or contract. We'll end each session at noon, regardless of where we are, and uh, then we'll just pick up the following week. So let's go. So this is the very brief consolidated uh, discussion of last series. The brief Holy Spirit summary. The Holy Spirit is God and equal to the Father and the Son. One of the reasons I thought that was important to say that that is a fact is because of this next one. Many times in Christian circles, we will hear people say, the Holy Spirit, well, it told me to do this, or it uh, did something for me. And I really strongly encourage all of us to realize that given that the Holy Spirit is a person, and in that past series we explored many of the qualities of personhood that the scripture says that the Holy Spirit has, we could never call him an it. Uh, and so uh, just that's one of the reasons why it was important to say in the first bullet, Holy Spirit is God. He's a person, not a mystical, powerful force. He's not just some force emanating from the Father or from Jesus. He is actually a distinct person. The Holy Spirit was involved in creation and in breathing life into creation, and also in sustaining life. Just a few verses on that, in Genesis 1, 1 and 2 says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and it was void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Most scholars will agree that that's not just some good feeling from God, uh, his spirit, uh, he was in good spirits, but rather the Holy Spirit was hovering over. And that word hovering we had discussed was uh, that of brooding, almost of a chick brooding over her eggs or her hen. He was nourishing this creation which was done. Psalm 104.30 says, when you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. And then the famous verse from Job 33 verse 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The Holy Spirit is our life-sustaining spirit. There's another verse, I think in Job also, where uh, you give, you take away your spirit, and we die. Uh, because we have his spirit, we can live. The Holy Spirit also wasn't involved simply in creation, but he initiates the recreation that we have, where we are restored into a correct relationship with God. Remember Nicodemus, John 3, 1 through 8. Uh, Jesus said in summary, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. He is saying that our rebirth is a result of the Holy Spirit's work in us. I want to read a quote from J.I. Packer. Recreation, regeneration. He's calling it regeneration, has been defined as an inner recreating of fallen human nature by the gracious, sovereign action of the Holy Spirit in that Nicodemus passage. 
The Bible conceives salvation as redemptive renewal of man on a basis of a restored relationship with God in Christ and presents that relationship as involving a radical and complete transformation wrought in the soul. By God, the Holy Spirit, by virtue of which we become new men, no longer conform to the world, but in knowledge of holiness of the truth created in the image of God. Regeneration is the birth by which this work of a new creation is begun. In the same way as sanctification is the growth whereby that continues. So we have the rebirth, and then we have that whole process of being conformed to the image of God, which is the sanctification process, in which the Holy Spirit is really heavily involved. Regeneration in Christ changes the disposition from lawless, godless, self-seeking, which dominates man and Adam, into a disposition of trust and love, of repentance for past rebelliousness and unbelief, and loving compliance with God's law henceforth. It enlightens the blinded mind to discern spiritual realities, big ministry of the Holy Spirit, that we can understand these truths, and liberates and energizes the enslaved will for free obedience to God. He breaks the chains, sets us free, so that we can, in fact, obey God. Good old J.I. Packer. That's an entire, probably, seminary course in itself. <laughs> he seals our relationship with God into a permanent state. Some of my favorite verses, uh, Ephesians 1, 13, through, uh, 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with this promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. John MacArthur said that there are four things that sealing signifies. First is security. The seal is akin to the ruler's seal. Nobody is allowed to violate it. And then he says, in an infinitely greater way, the Holy Spirit secures each believer, marking him with his own inviolable seal. Remember the seal on the tomb. Breaking that seal, punishable by death. The Holy Spirit sets his seal on us. We are sealed with him, so security. Authenticity. When God gives us his Holy Spirit, it is as if he stamps us with a seal that reads, this person belongs to me and is an authentic citizen of my divine kingdom and member of my divine family. Ownership, the third thing. When the Holy Spirit seals believers, he marks them as God's divine possessions who from that moment on entirely and eternally belong to him. The Spirit's seal declares the transaction of salvation as divinely official and final. We're sealed with them by the Holy Spirit. And finally, authority. When Christians are sealed with the Holy Spirit, they are delegated to proclaim, teach, minister, and defend God's word and his gospel with the Lord's own authority. We have the authority to uh, speak in God's name. He seals our relationship into a permanent state. He's the power behind our sanctification, that process of being conformed into the image of God. Sanctification is simply to regard as special, set apart, or holy, but also to consecrate, dedicate, and separate. Uh, there's personal, uh, positional sanctification, and that's where Paul in Ephesians starts going through the fact that in him we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ. Right now we have this position, this legal position of being in Christ. We are seated in the heavenlies with him. But then there's the experiential, that of how are we living and how are we being more and more conformed into his glory. 
And that's where the sanctification comes in. And then Unger, uh, these are some thoughts from his Bible dictionary, is the ultimate sanctification, which he calls the glorification or complete conformity to Christ at his coming. 1 John 3, 1 through 3, basically says, when we see him, we will be like him. That's our destiny. We are all going to be like Christ after we slog through this world with the Holy Spirit's power behind us. I like this quote from R.C. Sproul, who says that regeneration is monergistic. I had never heard that word, and I don't know if he made it up. He said, that is, it is something that God alone does, mono. Erg it's being Greek, for energy, right? It's a Greek word. It's a Greek, monergistic is a Greek word? Thank you. Mono meaning alone. Alone. And energy. Er, yeah, yeah, for energy. So God alone does it. But he says that sanctification is synergistic. Soon being a Greek word for together. Is that right? So together energy. And that sounds vaguely familiar from Paul, who said, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Well, does that mean I have to earn my salvation? No. It's that sanctification process that we do jointly with God. Regeneration, monergistic. Sanctification, synergistic, but with God's power. The Holy Spirit has taken Jesus' place in our midst, and indeed, he lives in us and advocates for us. We know the verses from Romans uh, about the Holy Spirit groaning for us in prayer with words uh, in, in groanings too deep for words. Interceding. The Holy Spirit also baptizes us into Christ's body. Uh, interesting, given the sin I noted that was present in the Corinthian church, this suggests that the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us and return to us as happened in the Old Testament. Indeed, if we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, he doesn't leave us. That's going to be an interesting thing as we look at some uh, scriptural examples of spiritual gifts. Recall that the Holy Spirit would come upon people and they'd be energized to do a specific task or tasks, whereas the Holy Spirit in this new covenant lives within us. And this, and I'm going to go over this in a little bit more detail. We've been baptized. It's non-experiential. And this happens at our salvation. But we can be filled with the Holy Spirit during our sanctification process. And this is a, a state where we say, I want to surrender my life to you, please work in me to sanctify me, and those other times where we say, I'd prefer to sin right now, and so uh, please leave me alone and let me do my sin. And at that time, the Holy Spirit is in us, and we're putting him through that sin, but he's not in control of us. So we get out of that state by confession and repentance and asking once again for the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives, and then we're in that harmonious relationship with him. So that's what I would liken the filling of the Holy Spirit to be. And then we can manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit by submitting to his power. This is not the gifts. Recall in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, those nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And Paul says, against such things there is no law. Those are the kind of things that kind of exude from us as we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, filled with him. <clears throat> now, because Holy Spirit baptism really comes to be a a uh, dividing point at times between some Christians. I just want to say a few things and then something about tongues uh, because that's one of the gifts of the Spirit and we'll explore that in more detail. But in the context of Holy Spirit baptism and tongues, I'd like to just do a quick review. Again, we're still doing a broad brush over the last series. 
Baptism by the Holy Spirit into Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit occurs immediately at salvation. This is what I believe. That's one group. The other group tends to say baptism by the Holy Spirit occurs at a time after salvation. And it needs to be sought. It just doesn't just happen to us. And the evidence of this baptism is speaking in tongues, either in an earthly or a heavenly language. And that is a position that I don't tend to follow, but it is one of the two major positions. <clears throat> Group one says that we receive salvation as uh, Holy Spirit at salvation, that we're regenerated, indwelt, and sealed with the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. Uh, rather than read the whole verses, I will simply read the, uh, the, the summary there, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. This tells us that the Spirit's baptizing work places the believer in Christ. Uh, Unger, Merrill Unger says that we are organically united to Christ as our head. Romans 6, 3, and 4 say that we're baptized into Christ's death. Colossians 2, 11, and 12 says that we're buried with Christ in baptism and we're raised up with him through faith in the working of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13, and a spoiler alert, 1 Corinthians 12 is one of those passages where many of the gifts are enumerated. We were all baptized into one body, namely Christ, by the Spirit. And 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20, those are the two major uh, verses where Paul is saying that we are temples of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit lives within us. We all have the Holy Spirit in us. And this was written, as we know, Corinth, to a church that was having real problems with sin. And he was saying, but you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is not leaving us. That's his dwelling place in us. Group one, uh, I found some quotes, and I don't know where those, these quotes came from. I had them in my notes over the years, and I hadn't recorded where they were from. from. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is non-experiential. Filling is experiential and variable based on our behavior. It is by the filling with the Spirit that the believer is enabled to maintain a state worthy of his standing. Paul, a few times, says we should walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Well, how do I do that? I'm still sinful. Paul said, wretched man that I am, who will save me from the body of this death? I don't do the things that I want to. How can I do that? The Holy Spirit's power, who enables us to do that. Positional sanctification is accompanied by progressive and experiential sanctification as a result of the Spirit's work in filling us. Okay, Group two has many subgroups also, uh, same as group one, many subgroups. It often focuses on the book of Acts with the Holy Spirit coming at different times into the lives of believers. Often focuses on the experiential aspect that can occur when being baptized, baptized by the Holy Spirit. And it puts weight on those experiences as an evidence of one having received the Holy Spirit. Some of that evidence might be speaking in tongues, gifts of healing, prophecy, uh, those sort of things, outward manifestations, miracles, uh, that that's the proof that you have the Holy Spirit. So I thought it'd be useful to look at the book of Acts, and those of you who are in this uh, session series last year might remember this chart. Uh, there were five places in Acts where the Holy Spirit uh, was shown to be given. And the first was Acts 2, 1 through 4, which was Pentecost. And who received the Holy Spirit? It was Jesus' disciples, the Jews. When did they receive the Holy Spirit? Ten days after the ascension. How? By God directly. And what was the result? There were 
what appeared to be flames of fire. Now, it may not be flames of fire, uh, but it looked like flames of fire on their heads. It was accompanied by the sound of a mighty rushing wind. It may not have been a rushing wind, but the sound was certainly there. All those things are immaterial. But they had a gift of tongues. Then in Acts 5, Acts 8, 5 through 17, the Samaritans received the gift of the Holy Spirit. When did that happen? After believing. Peter and John were sent to them. They believed and they received the Holy Spirit. How? Peter and John laid hands on them. The result, no result was recorded of, as far as miracles and things of that sort. Then in Acts 9, 3, 3 to 19 was the conversion of Saul. And that was three days after seeing Jesus is when he received the Holy Spirit. He fell down. We don't know if he fell off a horse. Everybody assumes he was on a horse, but it never says that in the Bible. He may have been walking. So he fell down, was blind. He, uh, Ananias was sent to him, uh, received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The scales fell off, laying on of hands by Ananias. And no uh, dramatic result except the scales falling off. Acts 10, verse 22, and then 44 through 48. This was Cornelius and his household. They were God-fearers who were Gentiles who believed in God. When did they receive the Holy Spirit? While Peter was talking to them, when they were listening and they believed, how did they receive him? By God directly. What was the result of that? They all spoke in tongues. And then in Acts 19, 1 through 7, there was this group uh, of Gentiles called the disciples of John. Remember, they had said, we didn't even know about that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, how were you baptized? We were baptized into the baptism of John. When they were being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, the apostles laid hands on them and they began to tongue, speak in tongues and have gifts of prophecy. What I would say with respect to that chart is if we use the events in Acts as a basis for how the Holy Spirit is given, we see that the process was not consistent. The Holy Spirit was given to distinct people groups, Jesus' disciples at Pentecost, the Samaritans, the God-fearing Gentiles, and Gentile disciples of John. And then Paul, he was also part of uh, uh, the Jewish group of people. With attendant miracles to show each of these groups are included in God's family. Now, Acts 11, 13 to 18, this was the account where... Uh, Peter and some of the, the, the disciples went down to Jerusalem and they were reporting on what happened, what had been going on in their missionary experiences. And the circumcised ones were not very happy that they ate with these Gentiles, the uncircumcised. And Peter recounted what had happened and they speaking in tongues and the, the authorities uh, Christian authorities in Jerusalem said, well then, who are we to argue with God if he wants to give this gift of the Holy Spirit and salvation to, to the Gentiles, who are we to argue with him? And what was happening, remember what Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And you see this progression of the gospel spreading right here in Acts and the confirmation that it was a valid spreading uh, by, by how uh, the Holy Spirit was manifested there. All who be believed received the Holy Spirit. And it's probably not a good idea to use Acts to set the doctrinal norm for this important gift 
from God. Acts was a transitional book. And uh, probably not a good idea to use that as, as the basis for how, uh, how the Holy Spirit is given, but more to use the, the kind of the doctrinal epistles as being our basis in which we're told that we're all baptized into Christ with the Holy Spirit. Here's another one of those unknown sources that I, a quote that I found in my notes. A second spiritual baptism after regeneration simply does not square with the rest of the word of God, sound historical evangelical theology, or the witness of church history. Also, we're not commanded to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You would think that if, if the Holy Spirit were given to us at a time after salvation, that that would be a really important thing for God to relate to us. Look, in order for you have to have the power to live the Christian life and to serve my body effectively, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is how you do it. We're, we're never given that command. But we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Or is it 5.18? It's 5.18, isn't it? This is my checker. On, uh, <laughs> on my, uh, that uh, do not be drunk with wine, for that is this dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So I, I think that that lends further credence to the fact that we receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, but we can offend the Holy Spirit and have him withdraw his power, not necessarily himself, when we sin against him. Okay, 32 minutes of, we did the whole last series in 32 minutes. Okay, now, we'll take a quick look uh, at some of the background on spiritual gifts. What are the spiritual gifts? They are gifts given by God for his special purposes to carry out his ministry in the body of Christ. This is why the spiritual gifts were given. They can be either an ability that we didn't have before, which we receive after receiving the Holy Spirit of salva at salvation. I would suspect those with a gift of healing didn't have that gift before. Uh, this was something that is very different than normal human experience. But it could be a natural ability, obviously one that was given by God, which is then used by God and enhanced by the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in more detail as we go through the gifts, what my gifts are, and that sort of thing. In his commentary on 1 Corinthians 12, F.B. Meyer states this, that a spiritual gift means an extraordinary faculty which operated for the furtherance of the welfare of the Christian community in which was itself wrought by the grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit in special individuals in accordance respectively with the measure of their individual capacities, whether it were that the Spirit infused entirely new powers or stimulated those already existing to higher power and activity. So you may have been a really disorganized person. Also, it doesn't just have to be healing or tongues or doing miracles. Uh, and somehow God has enhanced that ability, and now you are really top-notch organized uh, and have a gift of administration. <clears throat> Let's look at some scriptural examples of spiritual gifts that were given by God. Exodus 31, 1 through 5. Let me read that. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. Remember what the setting of that was? It was the beginning of the making of the tabernacle. You've got a bunch of folk 
who don't have a bunch of stuff, who, who knows, maybe all they did was build pyramids. And God, through the Holy Spirit, came and gave them ability and intelligence. Another translation says wisdom on how to do these things. A little bit further, Aholiab, Jen, is that kind of close? Aholiab? To pronounce it, the son of Ahisamak of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. Well, that's really neat, isn't it? God gave a command, and he gave the ability to fulfill that command. He doesn't just leave us hanging. All that I commanded you, namely, the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils, and the pure lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, altar of burnt offering and its utensils, the basin and its stand, finely worked garments, holy garments for Aaron the priest and garments for his sons for the service of their priests, And the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. According to the pattern that was shown to Moses on the mountain. And then Ezekiel 11.5. Oh, I left one out, which we'll go back to. And the spirit of the Lord fell upon me, Ezekiel is saying. And he said to me, say, thus says the Lord, so you think, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. Well, God, in this particular prophecy, uh, saying that uh, I know all things. But more to the point here, Ezekiel is acknowledging that what he's saying is directly from God because the Spirit of the Lord had come upon him. In Numbers 11, 16 and 17, the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. This is God talking. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you may not bear it by yourself alone. The Holy Spirit energized those elders and gave them the wisdom so that Moses wouldn't have to be the the elder for all the people of Israel. And a couple of more scriptural examples uh, aside from those four areas that we're going to look at next week. I said this earlier, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so there's an implication that you will not receive power until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And as a result of that, Jesus said just before his ascension, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the end of the earth. And so this promise was fulfilled when the day of Pentecost arrived, because they were all gathered in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of, as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. As a result of that, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now we know why they were all given, given that gift of tongues because Pentecost was a Jewish holiday and all the Jews from surrounding nations all came to gather to celebrate that holiday. God wanted to get his word out so that 3,000 could be saved in one day. And yet they wouldn't all have been able to understand Aramaic or Hebrew or whatever they were speaking in Jerusalem at the time. And so he got his word out through them. Pretty cool. So why were the gifts given? 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 says this. 
There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Why? For the common good. And we're going to explore that more uh, in a minute or next week as we go along. Ephesians 4, 12, and 13. The gifts were given to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to build up the body of Christ to maturity. A little bit further, skip a verse. Rather, speaking the truth in love, in verse 15, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, this is going to be a key part of this series for how do we use our gifts and why do we have them, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You've got this conglomeration of parts of the body and they have to work in unison with Christ as the head. As a result, the kind of things that need to be in the body in order to make it work properly and for the body to grow are distributed to members of the body so that the body can work to enable the body of Christ to work properly. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, As it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. And we know that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts as he desires. So we don't say, well, you know, I'd like to be an evangelist. Oh, I'd like to be a preacher. Uh, I'd like to be a person who does gifts of service. God gives those gifts to us, and he may give more than one. And it's not saying if we don't have that super energized spiritual gift that we can't do the other things that we'll be looking at in coming weeks. But God has placed each of us in the body just as he desired. And the other thing, uh, this is from 1 Peter 4. <clears throat> As we each have received a special gift, we should use it to serve one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. When we know what our gifts are, there's a certain responsibility to exercise those gifts. There may be times when I don't want to, uh, but it's incumbent on us because God has placed us into the body in the way he has to exercise those gifts. So there's a stewardship component of the gifts that we've been given also. <clears throat> and that made me start thinking of a couple of things. I won't, uh, I'll just read a little excerpt of uh, Luke 12, 42 to 46, that's a longer parable. But Jesus said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household or who will set uh, in the body to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, it reminds me of uh, 2 Peter. Where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the beginning of time, everything's uh, continuing just as it was. Uh, let's just do what we want. Uh, truly, I, uh, if that, my master is delayed in his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come in on a day when he does not expect them and at an hour he does not know, 
and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Now, this is not a statement of loss of salvation, but it could be a statement of displeasure if we don't steward the spiritual gifts we've been giving, given uh, to serve God. Now, in these next two verses, Paul is talking about himself and his cohorts. But remember, Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So I'm extending that to us here in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. So all this is rolling back to 1 Peter 4, 10. We should employ our gifts as good stewards of God's manifold grace. And that reminded me of 2 Timothy 2, 15, where Timothy, Timothy was being told by Paul, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And I'm taking liberty and extending that to rightly handling the gift that God has given us. So these are some reasons why the gifts were given and what our responsibilities for the gifts are. So some questions to consider. We've got 14 minutes. And uh, as we will try to do with each session, uh, we'll take some time to discuss. If we have no discussion, then we get out early. So, okay. Why do you think some people don't use their spiritual gifts? Have you considered what your spiritual gifts are? And how have you been using your gifts? This will also be applicable as we go on and start exploring what those gifts are and how we know what they are. But thoughts? Why do you think some folk don't use their spiritual gifts? Aside from not knowing what they are. Please. Okay. I don't know what my spiritual gifts are. Okay. So that's a, that's a very good reason. Uh, if I don't know it, how can I use it? And hopefully by the time we get done with this series, we all will have a better idea of what those gifts are and what we have. Other thoughts? Yes? Afraid. Afraid. Okay, good point. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, let's let's take that gift of evangelism or the responsibility for evangelism. Uh, I could fall into that, but being afraid. Yes. Well, in particular, the tongues that you're talking about, I know people that are embarrassed to show that they can speak in tongues. Uh -huh. They're afraid to. to scare okay. People. Sure. Well, and that's, and, and that is unfortunate, but, uh, but. Paul laid out some very clear guidelines of how tongues should be used in an assembly, too, and we'll talk about that as we look at that particular gift. But yeah, there can be a constraint. One of the benefits there for that particular gift, particularly if it is like Paul said, that uh, I wish all spoke in tongues, and uh, he has this heavenly language, uh, but then he acknowledged that not everybody does speak in tongues. Uh, but with that particular gift, they can commune with God in private. Uh, and so that's, that's a blessing for them, too. But it's a really good point. Other thoughts? Yes? Just along the lines of fear, I think of Moses and his um, lack of self-assurance that he could speak. Oh, okay. He's got the stutter. He's mm -hmm. like, no, 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 not me. So I think... Um, a lot of times our spiritual gifts are things that we're not good at, mm -hmm. that God has a, in, bestowed on us, and we're like, ah, no, I don't want to do that. Uh -huh. So there may <laughs> need to be a cultivation of it, uh, or God, can I trade in my gift for something else? Yeah. But yeah. what that would be saying is, <laughs> God, you don't know what you're doing because I gave that to you because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Up, right. right. <laughs> Where you know it's God doing the work and not us. Exactly. Well, and, <laughs> and that's actually one of the things with regard to the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about too, that uh, we've give, been given these gifts, and we'll cover that going forward, but uh, uh, in these earthen vessels, so we know that the power 
to do these things is not coming from us, but from God. And uh, there is a real risk at times that uh, we can get a little big-headed mm -hmm. because of how God's blessing us and what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of examples. Uh, Tom alluded to some of them today about uh, people who've uh, gotten off the rails uh, that started well but got off because of that. Mm -hmm. So true. Oh, thank you. Just to, that goes along with that, I, I heard a great quote that's that um, giftedness does not equal holiness. Oh. And that if you have a wonderful gift, that does not necessarily mean your heart is as it should be. That's such an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and that then ties into that process of being filled with the Spirit mm -hmm. and fully surrendered to Him mm -hmm. to, do, to do that. Yes. Perhaps there's also an awkwardness because I don't want to say, oh, I'm gifted at this or I'm gifted at that, mm -hmm. out of humility. Yes. Otherwise, I'm going to be a braggart. Mm -hmm. That's a very valid point. And as a matter of fact, uh, we'll talk about uh, jealousy of spiritual mm -hmm. gifts mm -hmm. next week. <laughs> How come he gets that gift? <laughs> I really wanted it. And what can I do about it? And, and in order to help prevent people from having that attitude, one might want to kind of put a cap on it. Uh, uh, the question is, like, how do I know I'm good at something? I mean, I may feel confident doing certain things, but I pray to God, I ask Him, I want to serve. Mm -hmm. What can I do well at? I mean, perhaps people reinforce and say, oh, Andrew, you're doing really good with this or with that. Um, but I may be hesitant out of humility. Sure. Um, I always remember the movie Amadeus where, you know, Salieri said, I have the thirst and you made me mute. Yeah. And this thing, this, <laughs> you've given him your voice. Yeah. And there's also that. So yeah. how do I know? Yeah, sure. we, uh, that good questions. And we'll start exploring some of that next week and mm -hmm. certainly develop it by the third. Perhaps good. trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Linda. We need to recognize and affirm the gifts we see in each other. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and if there's not that affirmation, uh, at times that can stifle us from using mm -hmm. using that gift. John. Yeah, George. John, what about uh, procrastination? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true. You know when when. Uh, yeah, <laughs> when I uh, entered into the unpaid workforce, as I like to call it, uh, I, I said, the first month, that's it. I watched The Twilight Zone, every episode, watched 12 o'clock high, all those things. And, and then it was tough to get, uh, in, on February 1st, to turn the crank again. And uh, procrastination, I think, is something that, if we were honest, we all have some component of in our lives. Yeah, did somebody else want to say something? I just, oh, Anastasia. I just said procrastination is laziness. Mm. Yeah, and I think that there's... Could be. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and well, and procrastination can really, we are so good at coming up with constructs. You know, I really can't get on to doing this Sunday school because I really got to get the taxes done first. So, oh, oh, and yet, it, oh, it's snowing. I guess I better do that. And so we may not be lazy, but we, although that's a big component of it, but we are really good substituters to put other things in place of things we know we should be doing mm -hmm. and that might be better for us to be doing. Could it, also, could it also be that we procrastinate, I mean, some of us, included me, who are perfectionist, mm -hmm. and, and if we don't feel we're going to do something perfectly, we just, you know, yep. Well, I'll tell you a little story because uh, I am uh, 
uh, not an upfront public person. When I was learning to ride a bike, uh, I set the bike up in my parents' living room and practiced balancing on it until I could balance on it because I didn't want anybody to see me not be able to ride a bike, mm. learn how to ride a bike. Mm. Uh, and so that, that's very true. And uh, so let me develop this gift of oration to the extreme before I will start using the gift, yeah. rather than yeah. saying I'm going to step out in faith and if I stumble, well, God's the one who's energizing me. And, John, I think the word for that that comes to my mind is insecure. People are, are they get this idea they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, that often holds them back. It's a thread that a, a few people have mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You know, I come back to what you were sharing, John, about the um, unity of the body, that these things are given for the, for the good of the of the, the common good mm -hmm. of the body. And so if we think of it from a, an anatomy point of view or organs, that when um, an organ under functions, it overly taxes other organs, and then they begin to become fatigued and the system begins to, mm -hmm. to struggle. Mm -hmm. So I think just remembering that imagery can help us overcome the hindrances of timidity or fear um, with respect to mm. if, the, if the Lord has seen fit to endow me with thus and so, speaking as the thought of any of you, then surely he will equip me mm. and enable me to press this into service mm. to the degree mm. that's appropriate. Excellent point. Yeah. Ultimately, Good it's point. for God's glory. It's not about us. But we, we first worry about us and how we're going to look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not about us. Right. Even if I look foolish, it's okay if it's for God's glory. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And the common good. Yeah. Yeah. With respect to the synergy you were talking about, it's kind mm -hmm. of a, um, a beautiful balance of submission and cooperation. Mm. Yes. Indeed. Go ahead, Anastasia, yeah. and then oh, Kate. I spoke enough. I think it, as we do in every part of our lives, it's it's again that we're focusing on ourselves and our imperfect selves instead of on the perfect God who gave us the mm -hmm. gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so having to continually redirect that in every different area of like, it's not about me, it's about him, it's not about me. <laughs> And, and there needs to be a certain childlikeness, I think, in us, which I find it very easy to learn. The kids are always willing to stumble and fall and get up and do something different. And, mm -hmm. um, and if those gifts are being exercised in a loving body, there's not going to be a snickering at somebody when they mm -hmm. stumble and fall at the other part, at, at their hand not working right, or yeah. you know, that sort of thing. I'm going to have to cut us off because I promised noon is when we uh, will finish. But before I do, next week we'll look at where can I find lists, lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible? What are those gifts? Are all the spiritual gifts in effect today? There are some people who say certain gifts stopped after the apostolic era. And uh, we'll talk about that a bit too. Uh, just as... A spoiler alert. Also, I happen to not think in that way. But, uh, <laughs> Dolores, w would you be so kind to pray for us? Oh, thank, you. thank you. Heavenly Father, we are grateful. We are grateful that we serve you, that you've given us the gift of faith to believe in you and to follow you, and that you've created the construct of the church where we can enact what it is that you have given us to do, and that's to spread knowledge and awareness and understanding of who you are as our Savior, mm -hmm. not to reflect upon ourselves, but rather for your glory. Father, help us not to fail or fall short of measuring up to that task, because it's not our reputations 
that matter. It's yours. If yours is sullied, people may not turn to you. And that's very, very dangerous. So, Father, strengthen us, equip us, guide us in knowing what it is you've called us to do. And help us, Father, to be introspective enough to examine with your spirit what are the impediments that you want us to overcome to gain the wholeness that we need to participate in the body that you have created. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.